250 years ago, where we are right now was the edge of civilization. It is a South Carolina militia button. It's got the palmetto tree on it, SC on each side. But this was where the pioneers came to establish their pioneer uh, lifestyle, and we certainly appreciate what they have done. That is beautiful, buddy. Half the people that came into this area were fine, God-fearing people who wanted to build their lives here in peace and freedom. <laughs> oh my God, look at that. It's my first whatever. This was referred to as the back country of South Carolina. Hi right, folks, this is T-Hawk with Back Country Diggers. And today, I have a very special hunt to share with you guys. Now this is going to be a little bit different from most of my videos because in this video, we are working close and side by side with a local historian, Durant Ashmore, on the battle, fo battle fort of Fort Lindley. There was a battle skirmish that took place there. Um, I don't want to say too much because Durant shares a lot of the experience of what happened during this video. There's going to be a lot of uh, commentary on his part along with some metal detecting. So uh, you guys get ready for a gooder or two as we go on a historically marked site for the first time ever. Let's check it out. For you folks who haven't been here before, but this is the site of Fort Lindley and it's quite an interesting spot. And I want you to know this field right here was where the militia was in camp on the um, day of July the 15th, 1776. The fort itself was just inside the tree line there. Uh, at that time, 244 years ago, this entire area would have been totally clear cut. There wouldn't have been a single tree within 200 yards of the fort. And the reason for that is that's the range of a hunting rifle, which was one of the primary um, uh, guns used in the defense of Fort Lindley. So uh, we have two eyewitness accounts of what happened during this battle. One of the accounts is from Patriot Forces, from a fellow named um, Matthew Brown, who wrote in his pension application in 1832 about what happened. The other account comes from the autobiography of David Fanning, who um, was a Tory who lived probably five or ten miles from here. And uh, he was a 19-year-old sergeant in the, uh, the Loyalist or Tory forces at the time. And David Fanning was the fightingest man that the backcountry of South Carolina ever produced. And it's unfortunate he was on the Tory side. If he had been a patriot, the war probably would have been over uh, two years earlier, I would say. So, um, this was the home site of um, James Lindley. James Lindley was a um, justice of the peace for the 96th district. He was appointed justice of the peace um, by the royal governor in Charleston in order to um, administer justice here in the 96th district. Because James Lindley had a royal commission, he was a loyalist um, commander. He was a loyalist captain. Captain. He was captured at the Battle of Cambridge, taken to Charleston in chains, gave his parole, saying that he would not raise arms again against the um, uh, Patriot government, and they let him go under those terms. However, in the meantime, another neighbor of his, Jonathan Downs, who was the commander of the um, Little River Militia, which is what our Little River Militia, uh, Regiment, which is uh, what this area was called at that time. Jonathan Downs took over this fort, 
with his militiamen, and he had about 150 men stationed here. James Lindley was homeless. He couldn't come back to his area. So he went to the only place that um, loyalists or Tories were welcomed, and that's Indian Territory, Cherokee Territory, which was only six or seven miles from here. Fort Lindley, that's what the fort was called, it was built during the first Cherokee War, 1758-1761, and um, it was used for protection against the first, the Cherokee in the first Cherokee War. When Lindley was granted this land, there was a fort that was owned here. During the Revolutionary War time, Jonathan Downs fortified the fort and used it for Indian protection. At the time, the British were attacking Charleston in the Battle of Sullivan Island. Uh, that was where Fort Moultrie was. There was a coordinated attack with the Cherokees along the back country and the British attack on um, uh, Charleston at the same time. The uh, British wanted to have two, a two-front war. So that's why the Indians were on the warpath at that time. So we have this account from Matthew Brown, who is stationed at Kellett Block House, which is 15 miles from here. And Matthew Brown's job, which he described while he was stationed at the Kellett Block House, his job was to bury dead and scalped settlers along the Indian boundary line. And he was there for about 30 days. And during that 30-day period, he buried 31 settlers who had been slaughtered by the Cherokee. There were a total of 60 that were killed all up and down the, uh, the border. So there were about probably 50 settlers in this fort seeking protection. Jonathan Downs' men were here, 150 strong. Matthew Brown and his um, group at the Kellett Black House got information from a Tory on the morning of July 15, 1776, that the Indians were going to be attacking this fort that night. The Indians had uh, gathered at Richard Parris' plantation at the Falls of the Reedy in downtown Greenville. Uh, one account Matthew Brown's account says it was 300 Cherokees and 300 Tories dressed as Cherokees. Uh, David Fanning's account, who was with that Loyalist force, he says that there were 245 Cherokees and uh, Tories who were attacking the fort. So there's obviously some discrepancy. So Ma Matthew Brown says that when the people at Kellett's Blockhouse got the information that Fort Lindley was going to be attacked, that night, they immediately repaired to this place. And they got here at dusk. And when they got here, 150 men from Jonathan Downs, the uh, Little River Militia, were encamped in this field right here. So the rescuers from Kellett Blockhouse come upon this group. Well, this group was drunk. They were bad. They were so drunk, they leveled their rifles at the rescue, refusing to believe that the Indians were going to attack that night. Well, Jonathan Sounds was convinced that there was going to be an attack that night. He stopped the rum and he brought the uh, militia into the fort to, uh, to defend Fort Lindley. Luckily, at the same time, a group under Colonel Beard, 300 strong, uh, was traveling from the Dutch Fork area to 96, and they stopped over at Fort Lindley. They came in the evening of July 15th and were here at the fort. So now we have 600 defenders of the fort. Um, David Fanning says that Colonel Beard's men camped a quarter mile away. Matthew Brown says the men were inside the fort, but whatever count is true, now we have uh, reinforcements here 
at Fort Lindley, and um, they were prepared. And at midnight, the force of the Tories and the Cherokees came through this area, and they surrounded the fort, which is just inside the tree line there. And we're going to go to the fort now and describe the events that happened from the defender's point of view. So we're here today with local historian Durant Ashmore, and we've got access to hunt in Fort Lindley. Now to my viewers who may be viewing this, don't try to come here without permission. So this is something that would have completely surrounded Fort Lindley. This is referred to as a body, A-B-A-T-I-S, and it was one of the defensive structures that uh, Fort of the Revolutionary Time had. You could not charge across this. You'd have to pick your way slowly through that. It would have been about 50 yards of, of, um, away from the walls of the fort. Fort Lindley was palisaded, and we're going to see the palisades here in a minute. But uh, this is one of the defensive structures, and almost every Revolutionary War fort had a body. You can't ride a horse through that. You can only pick your way through slowly as the defenders are shooting musket balls. What the defenses of Fort Lindley would have been like. It would have been palisaded all the way around. Bigger um, palisades than that, thicker, stouter. Um, there would have been firing platforms or um, uh, holes that we could uh, shoot out of throughout that area. This is typical of what the defensive trench would have been like. Ten feet wide, six feet deep. You have to go down the trench and then up. All the while, people are, are shooting at you. Now, I'm not saying this is one of the trenches from um, Fort Lindley. We're going to see the trenches from Fort Lindley. They're clearly defined. This most likely is an erosion um, feature, but uh, there was a secondary trench that did come through Fort Lindley, come right up through this area. So whether this has been like this for 244 years or not, I don't know. But uh, this is typical of what the approach to the fort would have been. Yeah. I know. These are the trenches. This is what's left after 244 years, but you can see, see where they were. And this is a very interesting feature from Fort Lindley. This is the Fort Lindley pit. We don't exactly know what it was for. When this when Fort Lindy was first rediscovered in the 1970s, and it was rediscovered by Roy Christie, who's a local historian, this is Hickory Tavern. Roy took a metal detector to this pit, and inside he found a brass button about an inch and a quarter across. He found three links of a homemade chain, and he found half of a pewter spoon. And those items now are in the Lawrence County Museum. While we're here, I would like to investigate this pit a little bit more. And I know that you fellas will be metal detecting that pit no end. We'll see if there's anything there. We may go down a little bit deeper than the surface area as, as shown here. But let's walk the trenches and you'll get a fairly good idea of um, what Fort Manny was like. Now, David Fanning, who was the Tory who attacked this place, he describes a fort built of logs. That's the only description that we have of Fort Lindley. A fort built of logs. Now, I think it was right here. This is the high ground. 
One thing that Revolutionary War forts had in common, they had a 360 degree view and they had water. So there's a wonderful spring at the bottom of that hill over there. Um, but I feel like, you know, this is the high ground. This is where the port would have been. But I feel like the entrance is over in this area. Um, and there's also some indications that the old Colonial Road ran that way. So we'll go turn that out. I said, I need to build another center. All right, so uh, we are now walking the trenches around the fort. Uh, fort is located on some high ground, leveled out, sort of at the top for. So that right there may be what what saves you. Plus, there are some unique rock features here that we're going to be talking about in just a little bit. Yeah, the turret. So there's more happening on this spot rather than any other spot at the fort. We've got a pile of rocks over there. And we've got a pile of rocks you can see through the woods over on this side. Plus there's another secondary trench that's running from that point. What could be the old colonial road is running along the bottom of this hill. I think this may have been the entrance to um, Fort Lindley. Much of what I'm discussing today is supposition. It's supposition, supposition based on um, other Revolutionary War forts that I have studied. But, um, you know, interpretation here is uh, better than in many other sites, but still there, there are some questions about uh, uh, just exactly how this fort was laid out. But what I think these piles of rocks are is um, shooting platforms. I think they may have been surrounded by um, like a circular uh, placement of the palisades. The rocks piled in the middle created elevating platforms, elevated platforms that um, defenders could have could have shot from. I feel I doubt that the entrance was straight in to this fort. I have a feeling that you would have to come up to a certain area, turn, and then enter the fort. They would make this fort as as hard as possible to get in. At Fort Thickety, which is another site that I'm uh, doing preservation at, extensive uh, body work there, but they had a brush arbor that was the only way you could get in to Fort Thickety, so that you had to bend over and crouch like this as you approached the fort, and it was just easy for defenders to take off the uh, attackers, you know, one at a time as they did that. So, this is where I'm thinking the, the entrance to Fort, uh, Fort Lindley was, with the actual uh, log structure being on the high point up on the hill up there. We'll continue on the way. So here we have another pile of rocks. This could be a random pile of rocks. This could have been part of a defensive structure. And if you'll look, this point dominates a 180 degree view of any um, attackers who would be approaching from this point. And remember that the Cherokees and Tories had this point completely surrounded when shots rang out on the uh, night of July 15th, 1776. What happened, um, David Fanning 
describes a brisk two-hour exchange of gunfire. Matthew Brown says they, the defenders here, after they had enough of that shooting, they charged out of the front door. I don't know why he calls it a front door. He says they charged out of the front door ten abreast and broke the Indian attack. David Fanning says when Colonel Beard's men came from a quarter mile away, the attack was called off at that time. Matthew Brown says we found much blood but no Indians. David Fanning says the only casualty was one Indian chief shot through the hand. But, um, you know, the, the defenders here described a blood-strewn field. And if there were any Cherokee and Tory deaths, they were, um, you know, carried off and hauled away. The next morning, the defenders of the fort formed a skirmish line a half mile wide and marched out of the fort at dawn looking for stragglers, um, wounded, that sort of thing. Three miles away, they came upon a clearing. And in that clearing, they found 30 horses, saddles, saddlebags, and uh, parched corn strewn about the field. In the saddlebags, they found the commission papers of James Lindley, the owner of this fort. Captain James Lindley attacked his own house. That's what happened during that time. Remember that James Lindley had signed a parole, probably, we don't have a record of that parole, but he, they wouldn't have let him go unless he signed a parole never to fight again. But here he is, they have proof that he's attacking his own house. Now, we have no record of what James Lindley did for the next 18 months. He was obviously in uh, Cherokee territory at that time. In December of 1778, uh, the British took Savannah. And they marched up and took Augusta as well. During that time, there was a resurgence of loyalist activity and there was a um, loyalist commander named John Boyd who came through this area gathering uh, supporters from this area and North Carolina as well. He raised a 600-man uh, army and they were marching down to Augusta to join with the British forces there. Well, uh, James Lindley joined up with that force. And as they were marching to, um, to join the British in Augusta, Andrew Pickens got between Augusta and John Boyd's force. And Andrew Pickens, with the force of 200 men versus Boyd's 600 men, attacked the Loyalists at the Battle of Kettle Creek, um, which is not far from Augusta down in, in Georgia. And Andrew Pickens was victorious because the Loyalist forces had very low morale. John Boyd got killed during that battle. James Lindley got captured for the second time. He was captured in the cane break. Now he's captured at the Battle of Kettle Creek. So uh, James Lindley is taken to 96 where he's put on trial for treason. And he, along with four other men, were hung by the neck because they had broken parole and in the eyes of the court at 96, they had committed treason. So that's the end of James Lindley. But his name continues to this day with uh, recognition of this fort, which is Fort Lindley. So here we have another vestige of a trench. And this possible trench goes down to the spring at the bottom of the hill there. And it's a beautiful, pristine spring. Um, most likely, if this was a trench down to the spring, it was a covered wave. And this is the way that the um, water source at 96 was accessed. Through a covered way about three feet deep, you would have had to basically crawl uh, through that area. 
there would have been dirt that came out of the trench, piled up on both sides, and there may have been brush across the top, making it covered. But uh, this is most likely a trench going down to the spring, which was the water source. Well, I mean, we've been all the way around the fort. Basically, that's the, the features there. Um, I would love, I'm sure y'all probably want to check out that pit as much as you can. I want to take the leaves out and, and kind of dig down into it while y'all are, while y'all are here. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing I'll be doing, but feel free to check everything. You can see the road. It's a little rough to get to, yeah. and it may be just a, a drainage ravine. But, um, I don't know that it is a drain because if you look, it starts right here. Yeah. I mean, if it was a drainage, it would have cut. Well, it could be coming out of that field, and who knows what went on with that field. And this field was obviously planted in cotton at one point. And uh, there's typical cotton field uh, ravines that you'll see, you know, further yeah, down. Yeah, yeah, through that. This curves back right up to here. Well, the other thing is, it follows, and I didn't really show you the path, but with green tape, yeah, you'll be able around. to see. You'll be able to see. Yeah. So I think that was a. This could have been like a corral for horses or something like that. But that's a secondary feature, a secondary trench. Um. That's you know. Yeah. 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 All right, fellas. Y'all have at it. All right. So Chester's walking up to me now, saying that he found something cool. Oh, man. What's up, guys? <laughs> you know what that is? I know what that is. It's a lock plate. Yes, it is. A colonial lock plate. A colonial lock plate. <laughs> Come on, let's go lay it on the ranch. How cool is that? <clears throat> Colonial light plate. Yeah. Alright, Mr. Durant Ashmo. Get ready, I'm gonna lay something in your hand. Oh my goodness. This is really cool. Chester found this. Alright. Ready? I'm ready. See if you know what it is. Oh my goodness. That is a colonial lock plate. Can go through there. Uh huh. That's the back to the lock. <laughs> wow. Now, where did you find that? Down the hill on the where you said it was old road. Yeah. This is something else, and there's a that goes all the way through it. That's more than likely a part of Fort Lindley right there. Could very well be. <laughs> Look at that. That yeah. hole. Now just imagine with me for a second what may have led to the event of that lock getting tossed out on the road behind the fort. Durant said earlier that James Lindley's land was taken from him, meaning that he no longer had access to his fort. Now, <laughs> this is just mostly speculation on my part, but I would like to think that he didn't hand over the keys so easily. So, uh... They had to bust that lock open and they tossed the parts in different directions. So, yep, that's my theory. That lock got busted open, tossed back behind them, and forgotten about them for 250 years till Chester comes along and digs that out of the ground. Yeah, yeah, that's what happened. That's something, ain't it? That is something. That is something. And it makes sense for the lock to be on the outside of the fort, too. It does. This is incredible. This is incredible. I believe I found the sources of the rocks. There's another creek down there. Have you been to that creek? No. No. I have a lot of rocks, and there's still more stacked rocks. 
out there. Um, there's a couple of them in certain yeah. locations on the creek. I think the sources of the rocks were right here. You don't see that creek. But, I mean, they're not going to carry them. I, I no. mean, unless they need to build up those shooting platforms. I'm doing, I'm just orbiting. Um, I'll yeah. come back up and, and help you with that here in a bit. Well, I'm just kind of pecking <coughs> away at it, taking it slow. And Have I you got an extra metal detector in your car? I didn't bring one today. I told him we have extra. Next time we'll make sure we hook him yeah, up if he wants to try. Anything. I don't need one. <laughs> I just see him going away. I wish you had a sister. Man. Sister? Yeah. Oh, a sister. A sister. <laughs> We're going to sit there and take you. <laughs> <laughs> you got two of them. Oh, I don't think you You'll find them uh, quite yeah. a lot in yeah. the Civil War. So when I caught up to Mike and Durant, they were talking about uh, this piece of lead. And uh, the conversation changed back to the lock that Chester found so fast that I didn't get a chance to really film it. But I've got some photographs of it, and this is it. Now what this is, is lead that was fashioned into a writing utensil. A colonial pencil if you will that is a cool discovery that Mike made that is a very cool piece and the first time I ever laid eyes on one but that's exactly what that is and what that was used for Battlefield. I think that is a pencil I don't know what else it is that's a piece of lead for sure it is a piece of lead well let me show you what Chester found are you ready? Okay. Hold your hand out. Look away. All right, this is what Chet found. Mickey Mouse. Wow. That is a huge lock. Look at that thing. That's cool. That's what Chet found, huh? Yeah. Where was he? He was down on uh, the other side of where we think the gate may have been between where, where we think the gate was and the Colonial Road. I just got confirmation on that. Yeah. Durant. That's a cool piece. That is a cool piece. We have Chester to thank for that. Yes. Right this, he'll be proud. Yeah, <laughs> he would be. Awesome. Alright folks, so just got a pretty good uh, mid-tone and uh Check this out. I dug that hole right there. That's probably about, oh, let me get these way under around there. There we go. That's probably a good nine inches down, nine, ten inches down. And I come across my first scooter. I'm going to put it out here in the sun so we can see it together. There she is, folks. I got my first button from this site. And she has full shank. Now that little button, it's just an ordinary sleeve button uh, used in colonial times. It turns out it is not brass, though. It is pewter with an iron shank. And... The, what's special to me about it is it was actually found within the boundary of the fort itself inside of its walls how cool is that a Fort Lindley Gooder and I got to uh, I got to discover it a piece of history it could have belonged to James Lindley himself I am very happy about that Let's go lay it in the historian's hands. He is going to be stoked about this find. <laughs> A little colonial cuff button. Nobody knows yet. Let's go see. Here we go. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Ooh.
Oh ya. Come on to a washer, huh? Yep. Hey. We found it at. Over yonder, where my detector is, you see the open hole. Yeah. That was deep too. <laughs> what kind of signal you get and this is this is handmade. The shank is offset. It's not centered. See that? Got on it. No, that's a uh, that's just dirt. It ain't got no ratting on it. This is a old that's an old made button. See, the shank is offset. Hmm. Hey, hold on before you get going. Okay. What you got now? Oh, I got a gooder. This is what we call a gooder. Ready? I'm ready. Lay it on me. Man, look at that button. That is colonial. Look at the shank still on it. It's offset yeah. too. It means it's handmade. See, it's not perfect. Mm. How did they weld that shank? How uh, did they I, form that? I have no idea how they did it. Look at that. What do you think this is made out of? That's probably brass. For sure, and it rang up a little bit higher. Is there anything on the face of it? I uh, I don't know. It looks like it may be a checkerboard pattern. I'm gonna give this to you, but let me hold on to it a little while longer. I want to show Mike and the rest oh, of it. Oh yeah, them. yeah, do that. But yeah. Now where did you find this? Uh, right over there where that where those rocks are. Where you think it might have been? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the entryway. Yeah. 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 Not far from there, and it was deep. Man, was it? it? Was deep. Yeah, it was a good nine inches. Who found it? I did. <laughs> Fantastic. Man, I... Yeah. I can't believe what all y'all found. Is this the way it always goes? No, yeah. Not always. <laughs> well, yeah, we have been on sites like this today, like a day like today, not find anything, but come back like three weeks later and find all kind of things. The rain's really helping out right now. Mm -hmm. Had this have been real dry, it would have told a different story. Yeah, hmm. that old colonial site where we hunt down yonder, it's uh... Sometimes we'll go in there and find all kinds of stuff, and then sometimes we'll go in there all day long not have nothing. Not a thing, yeah. yeah. The signal's like to hide from me, but man, I'm glad to give this, give this one to you. colonial washer. <laughs> <laughs> Tracy, come and check it out, huh? Look what he's got. Might have been a pistol ball. Might have been. That's the old white lid for sure. Oh, I got some old camp lid. Yeah, Durant, I think there's a checkerboard pattern on this uh, button. And a lot of these little buttons back then were hand carved. It looks like it's got a checkerboard pattern on the back. I could be wrong. That just may be the way the dirt's laying on it too. So what is this? They call it camp lid where they sit around making balls and it spills off. Wow. Yep, that's camp lead for sure. If they were sitting around here firing and had the uh, crimping tools for the bullets, that would have been the, access. the access. Yeah. Yep. And we're finding stuff, man. This is a good hunt. I think it used to be an old square nail. Yeah. So Mr. Bill just found something. Yeah, my detector's been acting up all day anyway. Oh yeah, that's definitely period there. That's one of them iron square buckles. Oh wow, that's nice. <laughs> that is super nice. Wow. Good find, brother. We saving history today. That we are. That we are. Now, back in eighth grade, they taught us local backcountry history along with American history right there in the classroom and one of the things that our history teacher told us about was the discovery of Fort Lindley which happened in 1970 if I can remember correctly by a man named Roy Christie 
He read an article in the paper, a write-up on Fort Lindley, and went on pursuit of finding where this fort stood. And it took him a while to find it. He uh, done some research, discovered an old map with just a simple name on it called Old Fort. But now they knew the area and the vicinity of where Fort Lindley could have possibly been. So he scoured the woods in the area until he actually stumbled across the fort itself. And he done a little meditating himself there back in the day. And he discovered a few things himself. Well, Durant surprised us with hot dogs. He got us some hot dogs and fed us, and the next thing we know, we hear someone pull up. And it is Mr. Roy Christie himself. What an honor it was to meet him. We instantly surrounded him and give him some attention and some respect. One thing I found, yeah. that's an old pencil. Yeah. I'm going to drop it off. Bust it. That door right point? there fit. Really? What is that? Two and a half inch barrel. Wow. wow. You can bark a squirrel with it. <laughs> I guess you could. <laughs> you know why you barked a squirrel, did you? You, you shove it right into oh, the tree, it? don't you? Yeah, bark it so you don't turn it to me. <laughs> Concussion <laughs> kills him, see? Uh, yeah, yeah, bark it all. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that thing shoots yeah. good, huh? I've shot it many times. This is something that uh, Tom That's found. That's the prettiest rose now I've seen come out. Yeah, and that is yeah. definitely period for the time, That's as cool, well yeah. as that bullet. That is an excellent specimen. Yeah. A little bit of butt. You know what makes them excellent, don't you? Is that fire? Oh, yeah. I know the rose. Oh, little check, I still got it. It's a, Do you? It's a food right there. The only thing I found was in that pit over there. Where we, we got the pit? Right here. Right here. Right here. Yeah, okay. Well, I found that... Um, a button about that big around and a piece of a pewter spoon or fork right. and three links of handmade chain. That, that was all I found. Well, Bill just pulled uh, something else out of there a few minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> That's part of a harness. A buckle. A bit belt buckle. Uh, either, uh, either iron buckle, horse tack, or I thought it might have been. You can still see with the tongue laid across there. Looks like a piece of a bottle. Well, it, it may be. It may be. I'm showing that a lot of plate. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, there may be something down there about a spring. Y'all been down there? Mm -hmm. I haven't been down there yet. Yeah, you showed me that look. Yeah. He's got a backhoe running down at that spring. He's just covered everything up. Now, Tracy probably either found the other part of that lock. Yeah, we think he found the other part. Or it's else he found the whole new lock. Mangle. But his came out in bits and pieces, but there's some recognizable. You've got a metal detector that shows what it is, what you're looking for? That's what we, I want. We have <laughs> one that would do that, yeah. <laughs> this, you just have to guess what it, you know, you don't know what it is so you dig it up. But <laughs> you'll show a ring, you'll show a ring, yeah. <laughs> right. That looks mechanical. Yeah. Yeah, if you look on the back of that lock plate, you see yes, the I saw that. Yeah, yeah. And then that's the mechanic. And then this right here looks like the uh, actual arm, maybe. I'm not sure. It does, don't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they were found so far place. apart. Yeah, that looks like the same metal, don't yeah. it? Yeah, that looks that's like right. it goes in between them. Those two are what those are, and they're even offset with each other. Yeah. Cool. That may either be oh, the same lock yeah. or the same lock together. Yeah, that's where the piece of it. it was busted off. I think they're two different locks because, you know, this piece is intact, whereas so that, that one, yeah, 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 that is right. Yeah, the pin is still through it. Exactly. Maybe it was. Yeah. Lock one, lock two. Yeah. yeah. I got some of those little cabin like that. Yeah. yeah, I've been out to your cabin with you before, yeah, remember? Seen them out there. Yeah. I've seen out there. I'd like to go back out there again sometime Any one day. Anytime you want to go, I'm, I'm available because I'm He's retired. I'm tired and retired. <laughs> <laughs> Did he say the muscle? I did. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The fire musket ball. All right. So this is the musket ball that Chester found at the edge of the fort, uh, going up the hill just before you would have reached the palisades that surrounded the fort back when they existed. Now this musket ball is significant because we think it's actually a part of the battle that had taken place and it was the only large caliber that had been found. It is flattened. Could it have been the one that hit the Indian's hand? I don't know. I don't know about that, but it's an awesome find nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Chester. That was a great find again. I am so glad we found some uh, historical relics to uh, to identify to the fort and possibly the battle itself. Um, wow, this this was an epic hunt. Which makes it even more interesting. Our museum with everybody. And all of our artifacts, Sarah Jane Armstrong, Roy Christie, all of us, the Richmonds who are the owners of this property, and the curator and some other people who know historic artifacts. And let's set up a meeting at the Lawrence County Museum and uh, spread everything out and discuss what we found. Okay. Be nice. Sounds good. So, that's... That's what I'll do. I'll, I'll set that up, and uh, we'll get everybody together. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of Backcountry Diggers. This is uh, a hunt in a lifetime for me. I was very happy to finally, for the first time, get out and, and look at Fort Lindley with my own eyes. The fort itself is on private land, and you have to have special permission to get out there. And through the historians that are now working with us, uh, we hope to gain more permission and help them discover more artifacts for backcountry history because uh, it's an extensive history and. Uh, it is the reason that I started Backcountry Diggers in the first place. Again, I hope you enjoyed the video. And I hope there'll be more of uh, hunts like this to come in the future. T-Hawk. Out.